insight, the first insight come from? It's got to come from somewhere. It's got to be the first spark that triggers up onto a, onto a yogi path. Even if that path takes many lifetimes, it has to have a beginning. And that's grace. That's Guru's grace. These are our Gurus, the texts. We have living Gurus. We have saints that live among, among us. That they were touched by their Gurus. They got something from their Gurus. And they've dedicated their lives to these practices, to these teachings, and then out of compassion they do what their guru did for them. And that's uh, open up and create opportunities for others to come in contact with the teaching and they plant, uh, plant seeds. So you have a nice community here. You have Swami uh, Sita Ramananda, uh, gave a lovely satsang this morning. Um, very just pure, pure, devoted, a beautiful soul. So these people touch our hearts and that's where we get our inspiration for our spiritual practices from our teachers. Some of our teachers you know, write books, that's the, these are also teachers. Tantra is our teacher, but Krishna is our teacher. And somehow or other, if we come in contact, if we come in contact with these teachings and start our own spiritual journey, then this is the goal of life. And we're enormously blessed. And it, it, it can never, we can never finish. We can never, once you start, forget about it. Once you start, you're finished. Your material life is finished. Your prakritic life is finished, even if it takes a hundred lifetimes. You can never, you can, pardon? Yes, you know what? There's a beautiful verse in the Krishna tradition. If you value, if you value the company of your family, the rep reputation in society, and if you value your attachments and your home and your possessions and what the world thinks of you, don't go down to the banks of the Yamuna River because there you might find a little blue boy with a flute who will steal your heart away. And once Krishna steals your heart away, you can never go back. You can have little relapses. You can have little relapses. Yeah, sometimes, you know, Amra just takes over and you go back out there. I'm going to find happiness. I don't care anybody so <laughs> Say, and you do it's fine. Don't judge yourself. You have a relapse, go have a relapse. Just keep the keep witness, keep the mind, keep the wisdom samskara because you can never, once it's there, it's never going anywhere. It's constantly going to be monitor, monitoring. And you go back and have as big a relapse as you want. Have a 10 life relapse. You can have a 10 life relapse. For 10 lives, take a detour. You, that wisdom samskara can, it is not, it's not like other samskaras. That can be pushed into the subconscious for life for forever. That is always going to be monitoring, and you're always going to be aware that you're that you're suffering and that you're failing. That you're failing to find fulfillment through the mind and the senses, trying to find happiness through through sensual stimulation or mental, emotional vrittis. So once we become, so the real, the first act of Viveka in the Yoga Sutras, the first time the word Viveka is used, is Vivekanaha Sarvanduka. The first uh, expression of wisdom, Viveka means wisdom. The first expression of wisdom is very unglamorous. It's very, uh, you know, not, it's not very, the first expression of wisdom is I am suffering. And this is why it's the first of the Buddhism, it's the first verse of the Sankhikarika. So, you know what's wonderful about this, these texts? If you didn't have these texts telling you that that was wisdom, and you were aware of suffering, you'd think you were a loser. <laughs> right? Because everybody else seems to be having a great time. And then you tell someone, I'm suffering, and they say, oh, you loser, you know, go to the doctor, whatever. So these texts are telling us, it's, not only is it okay to be aware that I'm suffering, but that is a sign of wisdom. It's not a sign of being a loser, that somehow we missed the boat. Everybody else is having fun, what the hell am I doing, you know? Sitting here trying to own, like a loser, on a Saturday night. Everybody else is partying, I'm just sitting here. So this, uh, these traditions then uh, comfort us, and that's why it's important to have community. Krishna says, what is night for the yogi is day, is day for the materialist. It's night and day. If you're all alone out there trying to practice, and everybody, all your old friends, and everybody out there is running around chasing desires and trying to have a good time out in the town, and you're there trying to do yogi practice, and if you're completely isolated, you can start feeling, oh, maybe I'm a bit weird. What's wrong with me? You know? 
So community is, is very important. It's not in Patanjali, but there are traditions. Patanjali talks about you know, Kriya Yoga, various ingredients of Kriya. But some traditions stress Sangha as one of the most important uh, parts of yoga. You've got to have community, you've got to be in the company of like-minded souls because then you, you reaffirm your commitment. You're, you're, not, you're not a weirdo out there in, on your own. So, practice. Once we start to become aware of suffering, the, the depth of our practice is going, to be, is going to correspond to our awareness of the frustrating nature of everything else. The two go hand in hand. As long as we think there's something out there, sarvam dukkha, what does sarvam dukkha mean? It's all frustrating. If we think alpam dukkha, you know, some things are frustrating, but there's still a few things out there, where are we going to direct our energy? To try and check out those things that we missed? Oh, mostly it's suffering, but there's still a couple of things out there I, I know I can find fulfillment if I just moved to California, if I just made a little money, if I, if I change my partner, if I... If I do this, if I do that, if I tinker with my prakritic situation, there's still a chance. As long as we think that, our energy is going to be directed in that, in that way. And we're, going to, and we're going to be thinking, I still need to accomplish this, I need to accomplish that, I need to write my book, I need to, you know, I haven't written my book yet, or I haven't done this yet, or I haven't you know, been recognized as a great teacher in this context yet, or whatever it might be. Um, so then we're going to, our energy is going to flow out in, in, towards that. It's only when sarvam, the reality of sarvam, all, sarvam, dhukha, all is frustrating. It's only when that really, not theoretically, not because we read the noble truths, because it's kind of a cool thing to read, but when that really dawns, when that settles deeply, when the sarvam, when the meaning of sarvam becomes, when we realize it, when we realize it, viveka, then, aprak, then, then, we, then our practice becomes verse number 14, Dirga Kala, for a long time, Nerantarya, no interruption, and Sadkara Sevita, we perform it with respect and gratitude, Sadkara, that we are just grateful that we have this raft that our teachers, our, our sages, our teachers have given us these means, uh, these ways of. Um, um, finding, uh, first of all, peace, and then bliss. What do I mean by that, first of all, peace and then bliss? Well, first of all, the mind has to become sattvic. And then we get peace. That's not the goal. Goal is the bliss of Atman. But that's long, a long, that's you know, beautiful goal at the end there. But almost immediately, as we practice, as we take our practice very, very quickly, we start to appreciate, uh, we start to experience the benefits of a peaceful mind, sattva. And once we, be, once, we, when we, once we start to taste sattva, then rajas loses its appeal. Desires lose their appeal. And you begin to think, what the hell was I doing running around for so many years? What was I doing? I must have been in a state of insanity. That's what mind is, is a state of insanity. Right? What is insanity? If we think I'm Jesus Christ, I'm insane, right? If I go around saying I'm Jesus Christ, we think I'm insane. To think we are what we're not, that's insanity. This is, so that's what moha means, that's what maya means, mayaha, maya, moha, it's a state of insanity. <coughs> Atman has forgotten itself, and it thinks it's something else. It thinks it's his mind, with its pretties. So therefore, yoga, this type of yoga is about still the vrittis, still them and get a, an experience of something beyond the vrittis. <coughs>